so this is the contractor I want to hire, the contractor I want to be. Uh, my name is Fritz. I'll be talking about contracting. Um, so, sometimes contracting is the best. And uh, I thought the best way I could express that is by showing you a Slack, a real Slack conversation that once happened between me and somebody who worked on the project. And uh, what I said was, I'm not normally a sweary person, but heck yeah. I was very excited about something. Um, like really like pumped up, like, yeah! Cannot believe that just went right. So right, so well. Can't tell you on camera what the story is. You can ask me afterwards. Sometimes contracting is the worst. We end up with frightened contractors working really hard without the skills they need, getting no useful feedback, building things that no one understands, that break on Tuesdays, and then get thrown away. So hopefully this talk creates more of the best and uh, less the worst. Uh, who I am, am I? Again, I'm, my name is Fritz. Um, I lived all my life in this city, Cape Town. Uh, it's wonderful, except um, I get uh, really bad headaches from bright light, and especially also like blue light. Um, you can get glasses like this that um, filter out the blue light, and before that I wore dark glasses in the office at my computer because I didn't understand the problem that I was facing, but migraine's horrible. Um, obviously the glasses you can only wear some of the time. I fixed that problem two years ago when I moved to London. This is a place called Bermondsey Beach. Uh, it's a few minutes from my house and no one in South Africa would call it a beach because it's not by the sea and there is no sand. Anyway, so my contracting journey. Um, in 2007, I started my career. I was working for an agency building custom software at um, really big corporates, the biggest companies in the world. Um, I was a tiny cog in huge machines. I was new in my career. I didn't know enough to take a lot of stuff in. It was just me plugging away at software that other people told me what to write. A few years later, I was sort of project managing, but still without a lot of big uh, context. Um, then, uh, middle of my career, I discovered something called Ruby on Rails, and I found myself working for small US startups, um, just me and like one other developer. And then um, all my clients ran out of money at the same time, so a little bit later, I found myself working full time. But then Twist, that company that I was working for, hired a bunch of contractors, and suddenly I found myself having to chase them around. and. Um, found uh, my team's output judged based on the results of their work and um, how we interacted with them. And now I'm back in the consulting game. Um, I work as a development team lead. Uh, that's a developer who has a tiny uh, bit of management. I only manage three people. And uh, I see those three people, well, not, not even every week necessarily. Uh, always writing code, that's always been a part of my career, and uh, both sides of the table when it comes to contracting, that's the takeaway there. I work for this company, they're called ThoughtBot, uh, they started in the US, but they're all over the globe. Um, the broader team that I work in is sort of within three time zones of the UK. Uh, again, I live in London, uh, we have people in Nigeria, Saudi, uh, Zambia, and of course UK and Europe. One of the really cool things about ThoughtBot is that uh, we do all our consulting, all our client work in four days a week. And the fifth day of the week, which is Friday in the Western countries and Sunday um, in Saudi, um, is used for investing in ourselves, uh, in the company, management things, uh, learning stuff, figuring out what you're going to need for the client, um, figuring out what you need to do to make your career go forward, hacking on open source. Um, so that's the thing that really sets ThoughtBot apart, and I think it really sets us up for success. Um, so, on to stuff about contracting. So the glossary, um, contractors uh, are people who charge per hour or day, or at least like for time really, and they work temporarily. Um, 
as opposed to internal or full-time employees who are working until further notice, until the company fires them or until they decide they want to, delete, want to leave, and they're paid a salary for that. Then um, clients, uh, when I talk about clients, that's the people hiring the contractors. And there's a third party, in some cases contractors work on their own, in some cases they work for agencies or contracting houses. An agency's um, role is they rent out staff at contracting rates, but they're still paying full-time salaries. And, uh, and they may work uh, inside a client, like just send somebody to the client's office and that uh, person doesn't have much dealing with the agency. Or they may take on a whole project and work on that project alone. Final page of glossary, I promise. Uh, consulting, uh, when I'm talking about consulting, that's maybe a subset of contractors. Uh, I find the title consultant is often used to raise expectations because people have low expectations of contract developers. Um, usually hired for a specific result, maybe that's like figure something out about the organization, change it in some way, read the code, write a report, um, or possibly deliver um, this specific system that's supposed to solve this uh, specific business problem. I think the hazards and remedies that I'm talking about in this session still apply. And uh, some conventions on notations when I'm talking, talking about contractors, the contractors are orange and the uh, internal employees are blue. I've also, if anyone is struggling with um, Differentiating between the colors, I've tried to add a little C to all the figures that represent contractors. So, story time. Names have been changed to protect the innocent or guilty. Um, so, this is Fred. Fred is having a bad, bad day. It's so bad that he's asked me to blur out his face so you can't tell who he is from the photo. Fred's boss just received an email from Fred's client. And the email goes like this. We know that you charge outstanding, meaning expensive, rates. Previously, that has been okay because you provided us with outstanding developers. In fact, one of your developers on our team, Jesse, is outstanding. Fred is not outstanding. In fact, he seems to be less than half as productive as Jesse. We will end our contract with you in two weeks' time. <sighs> kind of the worst, hey? Like, not a good feeling. Ooh. Okay, here's somebody else. This is Frida. Frida doesn't need a face blurred out. She's going for it. She's super happy to um, be known for her achievements because Frida's having a great day. She just got an endorsement on LinkedIn, and it goes like this. Frida's addition to the team led to an instant increase in transparency. Constant pairing with the development team helped to sustainably increase the team's velocity. She showed willingness to understand the project on a technical, but also on a business level. This helped not only to bridge the gap between product and business, but also led to better product decisions. That feels good. That's pretty awesome. So what went wrong for Fred? So Fred didn't understand and recognize consequences of the fact that contractors have different challenges and opportunities from full-time employees. And so here's five differences between full-time and contract software work. Difference number one is about risk and high stakes. So if a client has more money than capacity or bigger goals than um, they can realize with their current team, and they don't want to onboard a whole bunch of people to realize those goals, because adding lots of people can also break down your culture if you do it too quickly, <coughs> they might go and bring on a whole bunch of contractors. This is the contracting dream from a client perspective. So this year we add a bunch of contractors. Next year, we no longer have that sweet, sweet VC cash to solve our big problems. VCs are after profit and sustainable revenue. That's okay. Contractors are gone and we just carry on with the team that we had before with the same culture. In theory, unchanged, we're good, no damages. The reality though is that somebody is still paying the salaries. Um, so there is risk, but it's low for the client and high for the contractor. So the contractor takes on the risk of a quick exit and there's an economics reality check to be had here. To make that work, the contractor has to charge three to five times full-time salary. And they do that because they expect to not be billing all the time, whether it's because of leave 
or because the client suddenly end the contract, or because the client stops existing. Frida, she knows what, it, what this is about. She's like put on a thinking cap. You can see it's there, it's, it's pointy. Um, she's realized, hang on, they're paying me more, that must mean that, that ex they expect something more from me. Increased cost raises the stakes. That means they want results now while I'm in the building and not later. And it also means they'll be comparing me, especially the other developers in the room, with their full-time salaries. And I'm charging three to five times more. They probably expect something more from me. That will become relevant later on. So uh, difference number two, variety and learning. You get a lot more variety as a contractor over the last two years. My um, work with clients, I've worked with four different clients. I've come back to one of them. Um, so maybe you could call that five different projects. You don't get that um, kind of variety normally in a full-time career. Typically, if somebody has changed four times in two years, you're asking questions about their CV, like what's gone wrong here. Um, or maybe there's been some really turbulent market conditions, but that would have to be seriously turbulent. Stretch that difference out. So four clients over two years. Um, how many are you going to get in 10 years? 15, 20? Uh, so you're going to see a lot more variety, which for Frida means that she's seeing a lot of different things and learning a lot of different stuff as time goes on. Getting exposed to a bunch of different stuff, always learning. Fred, on the other hand, has not been able to maximize this. In year one, he knew the same stuff as Frida, but later on, he's still on that, and still on that even later. So moving around can increase knowledge, but it doesn't guarantee it because maybe you end up working on the same stuff over and over again. And there's a danger there because communication styles tend to evolve, even though the knowledge might stay the same. So you might feel like somebody who has 10 years of experience, but it's the same one year repeated 10 times. Meanwhile, you're carrying on with the swagger of somebody who has 10 years of experience and talking to people who've had different experience over the last five years, and you're still telling them, I know what to do better than you, even though you've only got that one year's worth of lessons. Okay, difference number three. Contracting can bring fresh perspectives because you're coming from outside and temporary. Uh, sometimes that doesn't work. Fred um, might look at a team that's doing something obviously wrong and think, hmm, I don't really understand what's going on here. These people are all looking in different directions, but I guess that's just what we do here. Frida, on the other hand, is willing to stand out and point out things that seem off. Something's off. Hey, blue people, what if we tried walking in the same direction? Maybe we'd get somewhere faster that way. New people ask obvious questions. Sometimes no one has thought of them. Uh, if you are a jaded contractor who thinks they have no power, like Fred, you just uh, imagine that that's just how it has to be. And obviously, somebody has asked the obvious question before. It's obvious. But somebody does need to ask the obvious questions. Okay, difference number four, potential isolation. So doing software well requires connection. Building the right software is difficult. The starting plan is usually wrong. It requires many questions to get it right, and you have to cross-reference the answers with other people's answers, because not everybody knows what, um, not everybody has the full picture in front of them. And you have to do it fast, because you don't have time to spend on low-priority items. You can't be building things that already exist. It can't be manually performing processes that are already automated. Like, try go click around in the AWS console, when the team has automated all their processes with Terraform, they're going to be really irritated with you. You're going to be taking the team backwards that way. All of that requires more questions. So you need to understand the existing landscape, you need to know uh, existing code and systems, and you need to know how the internal team works. Contractors are at a, distance, uh, at a disadvantage here. There's a figurative distance. You're not there for the water cooler conversations or the remote equivalent of the water cooler conversations. You aren't there, you weren't there when the systems were being built. You don't have the history. 
And so poor Fred, uh, he's got a job to do. He's been told to do something. He thinks he's figured it out, and he's just going to keep going in the wrong direction, away from everybody else. Frida is capable of self-examining and repositioning herself. And there's a negative feedback loop here, because if we feel isolated, we don't trust that we can safely ask for input. So the more things feel like they're not quite right, the more we're tempted to just put head down and work harder, and so we end up going faster and faster in the wrong direction. Contractors need to start, start out isolated and need to work to get to square one. Difference number five is disempowerment. Uh, all of those things you need access to, business ideas and uh, tools. The thing that often happens is that as a contractor, you get stuck with like one point of contact and the business assumes that that person knows everything that they need to in order to help you. But generally speaking, no one person does. And so you miss out on your access to the people and the systems and the tools that you need. Frida's pretty good with this. She knows that she can't just speak to that one person. She has to go find the other people that she needs to talk to. Fred didn't notice that anything was wrong. Assumes that he has everything that he needed. Okay, that's enough of Fred and Frida for now. They'll be back later. <laughs> Thank you, Fred. <laughs> Thank you, Frida. Um, so uh, let's talk about investing in contract success and addressing some of these problems. So I see three investors three parties, clients, contractors, and agencies, and they can each take actions um, to make this contracting thing work better. So clients can invest, and here's some techniques for clients to empower and connect contractors. So first up is onboarding, um, which is something that probably naturally happens whenever a client engages with the contractor. It's like, yeah, here's what we want you to do, here's what we think you need to know. Contractors have a habit of breaking that because they come in with no context, as opposed to all the examples you've seen before, which is like somebody moves from one team to another. And sometimes they also come in at a flood, like a whole team at a time. You can have the contractors improve the onboarding so that the next person who comes on uh, does get the context that the first person missed. It's also a great way of building the knowledge and making sure it sticks in the first contractor's head. Next up, obviously, documentation. You can't possibly hope to share in that first week what exactly is um, necessary for the entire project. So they need documentation as a reference. In my mind, the things that make for the best documentation are not like, uh, this is what line 47 of that class does. It's more like, these are the principles. These are the things that talk to each other. These are the system boundaries. Stuff that will uh, not change so much over the course of time. And then there are some technology tricks. I mentioned DevOpsy things, so you can uh, automate infrastructure, and that takes away a whole lot of complexity from the contractor. And uh, self-documenting code is quite a cool thing. And for me, something that I've really enjoyed doing is um, self-documenting errors, where the error actually says, like, hey, you've encountered this error. This, that probably means that something has gone wrong in this other system. He has a link to those logs, or he has a link to documentation about it. You have to be realistic about that investment, though. It depends on the, um, on the stage of your company. You can't be uh, automating all your infrastructure before you're making any money selling anything. So, for instance, you might consider uh, outsourcing this kind of investment to someone else. Maybe use a platform as, as a service like Heroku or Netlify or one of those. Uh, but regardless of the stage of the company, there's some evergreen soft skills. Uh, Collaboration is important. Um, there's no better way of transferring information than by individuals in a team showing, here's what I'm working on, these are the problems I'm facing, and hopefully actually, in fact, working together on those problems with other people so that you never hit a bottleneck. Also, speeding up feedback cycles, uh, delivering software as fast as possible. Oh, sorry. Yeet. No. Okay, we'll just go back here. Um, delivering software as fast as possible because humans can't work out what, uh, what software is going to do until they use it. And they can't work out whether it's going to work, out, work right or wrong until they use it. There's no planning exercise that you can go through before software exists that will tell you 
um, whether you're going to have success with that thing. So build small pieces at a time and um, get feedback on it as fast as possible from users. Okay, contractors can invest. It's a good idea to learn to play before you join the band. Um, standard software learning advice, read a book, take a course. Uh, bonus points for doing that at human hours with another person. Um, so that you're not learning at like five minutes to midnight when you can't take anything in. Um, try contributing to open source. And a fun one for me recently, I tried to become a top 10 contributor to a topic on Stack Overflow uh, for a month. It was kind of okay. It was a lot harder work than I thought it would be uh, because I feel like was the topic in question was Ruby on Rails. I feel like I've been using Ruby on Rails since 2014. I know what's going on in there. Um, but actually, it turns out like, hey, I didn't know what Rails is doing over there with sending emails or like what it's doing with sanitizing parameters over there or that kind of thing. So you broaden your knowledge and you, um, you find out what you don't know. Uh, and of course, you want to be able to learn on the job because you do probably spend more, work, more time working than you will ever have to learn on your own. Um, I love pairing. And I know people in the world, some software developers are like allergic to pairing, but my challenge to people who don't like pairing is to actually try it and then write down the specific things that you didn't like about it and see if there's a way that you can address those things without throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So not throwing out the entire concept of pairing. Pay attention in team conversations as a contractor. Um, it's really tempting to think, um, like, uh, everybody else has context, I'm just going to slow the conversation down. You don't have to slow the entire conversation down. You could just pick one thing you don't understand and revisit it later with somebody in private. So it doesn't have to be an embarrassing thing. That said, I would encourage software teams to try and create a culture where it feels okay to ask questions and it doesn't feel like it's going to kill somebody to ask a question. And if somebody is explaining something to you and you don't understand, draw a diagram. Um, if you draw a diagram, the person who's explaining to you will realize, oh, actually, I wasn't explaining it that well. And um, if they were explaining it that well, then your diagram will probably be brilliant. And then you'll have documentation that everybody will love you and think like, hey, who's this cool Fritz contractor who's in all my code commits, prodigy finance? Um, so, learning though, uh, don't expect to do all of those things all at once. Expect to start small. For instance, at ThoughtBot, we have a group that meets once a week. They watch a five minute video from a website called The Graceful Dev and then discuss it for 30 minutes. Um, super easy, super tiny step. And the returns from that really are very good. And ask some meta questions for growth. What makes a good product? What does the software team need? What caused things to go wrong on previous projects? What helps on previous projects when things went wrong? Above all, don't sit in silence when you have questions or when things seem odd. Be like Frida, not like Fred. Fred would be going, this is fine, while the building is burning down around him. And building a habit of breaking silence. Um, retrospectives are great if you can get them right. Uh, doing post-mortems that are blameless or blame-aware. I heard this term today, blame-aware Postmortems are postmortems where we acknowledge that we have a tendency to blame people and then we try and move forward because it's not going to help just to blame somebody and not learning any, learn anything from the exercise because it wasn't my fault. You probably can learn something from the exercise and the team probably can discuss how to support the person whose fault it was and you probably can help people in future learn um, how not to repeat that mistake. And just have conversations. Don't be scared to talk to people. Final party, agencies can invest. Agencies um, have some options. What we want them to do is to create variety, not keep people stuck. We want them to create teams with diverse strengths, not teams that reinforce weakness. We want them to offer support, not scrutiny and pressure when the client is screaming. We want them to see learning as essential, not awkward overhead. Oh, sorry, there was somebody taking a photo there. 
There you go. Cool. Okay. Um, clients, please, please, please quiz your agency. There's nothing wrong with asking questions that aren't just about finances. If your project costs 20% less, that really does not matter if it fails. Feels like it's probably a good idea to ask some other questions about success. So, personally, if I were working with an agency and I work for an agency, I would like to receive these questions. And I would not like to be spouting nonsense like this. Our team members are the best, so nothing ever goes wrong. But if it does go wrong, we'll work harder to fix it no matter what. That doesn't cut it. Instead, what I want to be able to say is stuff like, we expect our team members to identify, communicate, and mitigate risk so that surprises are not disastrous. Or, it's important that we all ask what has gone wrong and fix the underlying cause so that we don't repeat those mistakes. Or, all plans go wrong sometimes, but we're good at identifying the work that delivers the biggest bang for buck and will help to understand how to maximize the remaining time. So here's some questions to ask an agency. What do you need from us to ensure success? How does your agency support your team members? How do you handle rotations? When and how do your team members practice their craft and learn? When do your team members do agency admin and management? So, um, revisiting Fred and Frida, they're back ever so briefly. I want to say be kind to Fred which is not the same as enabling Fred. We don't want Fred to just carry on making the same mistakes over and over and over. We want to support Fred. We want to help Fred be more like Frida because Fred's turn into Frida's. And how do I know this? Those were real examples. Fred is Frida, is me. And yes, I really had that email sent to my boss about me. Um, that is everything. I have some further reading if you're interested. Uh, the Phoenix Project and The Goal are really great books for understanding DevOps culture, which is not just adding Terraform to everything. It's a whole different way of working and, and understanding business. Uh, the Scrum book, Scrum is much maligned, I think, because of buzzwordy consultants, um, but the Scrum book is really pretty good. It's called The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time, which I think we all want to do. It's not a magic trick. It, it's the like, headline of it is don't do stuff that doesn't matter. Um, but it really does add up to working a lot more effectively. And then there's a book by one of the signatories of the Agile Manifesto called Ron Jeffries called The Nature of Son Software Development that has shaped a lot of my ideas. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm at If the Shoe Fritz on the socials, ZA Tech, uh, Mastodon, Ruby Social. Uh, you can find some of the stuff I write on ifthesshoefritz.com. Are there any questions? Did your client cancel the contract after two weeks? Did the client cancel the contract after two weeks? They definitely did. Yes. How did the agency handle that with you? Did they that? Yeah, okay. How did the agency handle that with me? Uh, my boss, I feel, was very transparent, so she called me and the person who I called Jesse, she called us in remotely um, and said, I just want to read you this email. And I already was feeling like uneasy because um, I, yeah, I felt like I'd sent something stupid in a meeting like a few minutes before. Uh, and then like she goes, I'm like, okay, where's this going? And then like that line hits less than twice as, and like, Oh, the, the pain. It was horrible. Worst day of my life. Um, but after that, she was incredibly kind. She was just like, mm, they got some stuff wrong. We got some stuff wrong. And um, uh, it sent me on a whole lot of soul searching. So the transparency was really helpful. Um, but it didn't have like repercussions that caused me to stop functioning as a human or as a developer or like try to avoid making mistakes at all costs. And yeah, so they handled it really well. <laughs> Like figuring out if this is still a cost or 
Okay, so if I'm understanding right, the question is, how do you onboard a contractor? Um, with the motivation behind the question I'm hearing is sometimes it feels like what it takes to get contractors onboarded is not worth the cost. Okay, so um, I first add a little like anecdote I have from a relative of mine who works at Amazon, um, who says that, ooh, actually, I, I should not have said that. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Damn it. Um, I, the reason I should have said, shouldn't have said that is it's not really controversial. It's just um, probably there's people, maybe there's somebody on YouTube watching or uh, in the room who works for Amazon who's just going to say that's flat out wrong. Don't, don't believe the lie. But anyway, uh, he told me that in his team anyway, uh, they didn't expect developers to be fully productive in less than six months. Um, so I think it is normal no matter who you are and how much backing you have to take time to become productive. Um, as to specific things you can do for onboarding, um, the best example for me that I've seen of onboarding is actually the client team that I'm working on at the moment, where the ThoughtBot developers have put together a whole checklist of like, uh, have like in your first week, you'll have meetings with this person, this person, and this person on these four topics, read these documents, make sure you can access uh, these systems, the logs over there, the metrics over there, all of those kind of things. And um, at the end of the document, it says, okay, now if you've had any problems, go back and edit that, um, this onboarding document to fix it. Um, is there anything more specific here? Um, I guess, like, six months is a long time. So for me, it's easier, like, contractors that are like, short term mm -hmm. periods. Mm -hmm. So, like, two months. Mm -hmm. like, two months. So, like, what is the difference of taking a lot to just get that space where mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so maybe you expect somebody full-time who's uh, going to be around for years, you're prepared to invest in them for a long time, but not, um, not for somebody who's only around for a few months. I think there, for an, a contractor or an agency to say that they are prepared to take something on for three months, either there's got to be um, something that's really super self-contained that requires very little knowledge of the next of the rest of the organization. So maybe just building a like pilot or a prototype or something. Or they've really got to be very good, like very top notch and uh, have invested in themselves so that they are super skilled in the technologies you need. Um, or they've really that they've solved that kind of problem before. Um, I, yeah, I, otherwise, like, I mean, just trying to create results magically, you, you need to have a tight scope or, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, so um, I'm interested to know about the, the Friday, what mm. guys do. Mm. Like, how do you ensure that that doesn't just become like a cold Friday, I can just chill, do whatever. Mm. How do you measure that? Do you, do you guys mm. measure that? Like the, the input or the, 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 the things that the, your devs are doing? Yeah. Okay. So I mentioned earlier in the talk, Friday on Fridays, Thoughtbot uh, takes a break from consulting and invests in ourselves. And the question is, um, how do we make sure that developers don't take advantage of that? Yeah. Um, so there's a there's a way of looking at that that says like you have to have some control, and I suppose the control there is that line managers talk to developers about what they're doing with their investment time. Um, we also try to hire people who are like emotionally invested in getting better and are often a, a signal for that might be like uh, they've done some open source work and find this kind of thing um, fulfilling like they've already got something that they're interested in. Um, I think uh, there's also another aspect of it is um, collaboration. We try and encourage people to work on things together and then there's naturally a like, oh, well, like I'm building this thing and this other person was supposed to help me hey, how can I get you involved? But a very important thing for ThoughtBot is that um, we're trying to do things um, 
with transparency. We're trying to hire and be people that are um, like self-motivated and um, self-manage well. And uh, we're always trying to support people to like manifest those qualities in greater measure. And so it is surprising how often like somebody might feel like sort of disconnected and just kind of like going through the motions and like not really that involved. And somebody else will say like, hey, I noticed you showed up late for that meeting or you like didn't respond to this thing. Like is something going on? Um, so I think it's, it's all in the human relationships that we manage that. Okay. Yeah. So it's the, you guys do your, your hiring is you do a lot of pre-filtering and then there's a constant engagement of like, okay, you guys are fixed up. And then, sorry if I'm going long, but like what if, have you ever had a, a case where the you know, person was fantastic, has been fantastic, you know, past the filtering stage, has been delivering, delivering really well, and then they hit a situation in their, in their life, let's say something happens, and then, um, you know, they're in that sort of rut, and, um, and then, yeah, those five days are not, they're not doing anything, mm -hmm. so, in no those situation, what do you do? Yeah, I've probably been talking too much, like, company policy for, yeah. um, like, it's not like I define company policy or I'm, I'm super high up. Um, I would say that um, those kind of situations happen on a case-by-case -case basis and you uh, really try pay attention to them. Um, and sometimes it is necessary and important for somebody to trade um, their investment time for in technology for something completely different like their mental health. And um, in that case, like take a break. You, you're going to do bad work and feel worse about it if you just try and keep pushing on while you're in that state. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, as somebody taking on a contractor, how would you keep that person motivated at the time? And as a contractor, how can you stay motivated? Because I've experienced, I've found them at the time, and they start producing less and less, and now if you change them up, then you have to start all over yeah. Um, yeah, so the question is, how do you keep contractors motivated over time? Um, so, something that ThoughtBot does, which may not be very relevant or helpful to you in this situation, um, is that we try to rotate people so they're not on the same project for years and years on end. In theory, like I think at some stage we had something written down saying that we wouldn't have somebody on a project for longer than four months. I know that that's not the case for where I, for the situation that many of our developers are in now, but there is intentionally like every two weeks or so we're having a meeting saying who needs to rotate. That's one thing. Um, another aspect is like the engagement and participation. And I think motivation in a lot of software projects comes from like seeing results. And, um, so where people's motivation tends to drop off is that they like there's not really a clear end in sight or a clear goal and it's like we just we keep on doing stuff and things are going slowly and we can't see any improvement and we can't we don't know what we're aiming for so we always trying to keep a razor sharp focus on what is the goal here what can we do to reach that yeah <laughs> Um, so the question is uh, partly how do you uh, set rates fairly and um, what do I feel about the fact that you have to charge a lot more? Um, there's the stuff that was in the talk about um, uh, like I have to be on my toes and, and be aware of when I'm wasting time. Uh, I 
personally wouldn't ever want to charge by the hour, um, although I have in the past. Um, thought about charges by the day. Um, I think you can you you can charge a um, like a you can have a notice period. Like um, we only uh, uh, you, you can't fire us with less than two weeks' notice or something like that. Um, as to how would you go about setting rates, um, I don't have that thought process mapped out well in my head right now. Um, so maybe we can chat afterwards, talk through some ideas, but yeah. Um, yeah, this is. We name skills for a new project, a new client. How do you differentiate between you're learning for the project that you're all for and learning, you know, because maybe the shortcoming that you feel have and you sort of just take it on the chin. Yeah, I think there's quite a danger in taking it on the chin. If taking it on the chin means I'm just going to work harder because you end up in a trap where you work harder and harder and um, you end up burning out, I think. Um, taking it on the chin there for me might be like, actually, hey, client, sorry, I don't know. I don't know this stuff. Um, I need to pause here and, um, and learn some stuff because your money is going to be wasted if I proceed as I am. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot more that could be said on that. I do see the time's up, so thank you very much, everyone.